So I'm always excited to introduce new folks into the YouTube sphere. And today I've got a really great guest who's a financial guy who helps corporations make decisions like on things like mergers and acquisitions. Um, and his name is Rene. He's from Germany, but he has now come out to British Columbia. Rene, glad to have you on the show. Thank you, Rene, for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. So um, if you like content where we have guests like Renee on, hit the like button. And then, of course, we'd always like you to subscribe and, and uh, hit the notify button because, man, we got a lot of amazing shows this week. I can't even begin to tell you, but I've listed them down below. You can take a look at the shows that are coming up and you'll find out why you need to hit the notify button. And then, of course, we'd always love you to have you as part of our Patreon. So, Renee, um, just give me, talk to me a little bit. So, somebody wants to do a merger or an acquisition, you go into the financials and decide whether it's a good deal? Yeah, we usually provide them with valuation services, with financial due diligence and with business, re business reviews um, when, when they acquire other companies. Um, it's typically financial sponsors, but it can also be strategic acquirers. And yeah, there's a lot of um, financial advice that it's necessary in these situations. And I'm working for a company that, um, yeah, provides that. Are you helping out the regional banks right now in, in the United States? <laughs> uh, if, um, I actually I have a financial services background. So uh, a lot of my clients actually in the financial services space, but uh, not directly yet at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Pacific West is not on your list this week, huh? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So, well, you and I got to know each other because I picked one of your stories. I guess it was, uh, maybe on a subreddit or something. I can't remember where that uh, blog was posted, but you were talking about Mobileye and uh, I think you had kind of a complaint, maybe, that Mobileye was um, valued at $30 billion and basically that Tesla, uh, their much more advanced uh, capabilities was valued at zero. <laughs> or that's Actually, that's my interpretation. I'll let you Tell us what you were trying to do with that with that particular story, which we will which we'll note we'll link below. Um, yeah, so I don't know what the markets have priced in for Tesla FSD at the moment, right? It's not um, traded um, separately. Um, but mobile I always um, interested me because um, it's a pure play company on full self driving, and they have been active in this space for like twenty years, um, like a true first mover in the space. And I was just curious, they, they reported their earnings, um, I think, two weeks ago. And I was just curious. Um, yeah, the stock was down a lot. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to figure out what's going on with this company and whether that can inform us about the value of Tesla FSD. Um, so if if that was traded separately, um, what could that be worth and how much of Tesla's market cap is likely the FSD program at the moment? Yeah, so you you dug in. And by the way, folks, if you if this is interesting to you at all, his, his blog on this is in depth. I mean, it goes into a lot of great detail with a lot of uh, graphs and charts. And so uh, what was your assessment? Uh, obviously we know what they're worth. The, the valuation is around 30 billion. Is that is that still true today? I haven't followed it uh, since your story. Yeah, I think that they're roughly still at the 30 billion level right now. And um, so the loss making, they're generating 2 billion in revenues per year. Um, most of that is from their um, assist driving products. So it's mostly like one front camera in like premium vehicles for um, yeah, um, emergency braking purposes. Um, but they also have something in place, um, which is called supervision, where they have like, um, like a similar um, software and hardware suite that the uh, Tesla FSD um, product has like 11 cameras, radar, um, yeah, and then so they're trying to deploy that uh, to, um, um, yeah, OEMs. Um, at the moment, they only have that in China with um, a company uh, with a premium brand called Zika. Um, that's um, under the Geely or Geely umbrella, probably butchering the name there, but um, uh, yeah, people probably know that. And um, yeah, so they, they have like 100,000 vehicles there on the road and, and, and they're trying to do the same thing that Tesla is doing, basically. That's at least my impression. Um, yeah, and it was just interesting for me to figure out um, how successful that is um, at the moment, um, yeah, compared to what Tesla is doing. So according to your, now, first of all, do they use LiDAR as well? 
um, they will use LIDAR in the next iteration. So they have like five levels. The first is, as I pointed out, just the base driver assist. And then in the long run, they want to operate like mobility as a service. And the supervision is sort of like the third level in this five level approach. And the following um, approach that will include LIDAR. So they believe that in order to have full autonomy, they will need LIDAR. That's how they differ from Tesla um, because they think they need two redundant systems that if they have a conflict, then that gives them all the information that they need to have a, a better, a superior perception of, of the environment. And um, I think that's called mobile eye chauffeur. It doesn't exist yet. They want to roll that out in a couple of years. So for now, they don't have LiDAR in their supervision product. Okay. And so uh, so are they going for this kind of general uh, uh, approach that uh, Tesla is going? Uh, or, do they, or do they map uh, locations before they uh, are willing to tackle them? So they have this um, mapping system. It's actually quite interesting. It's called REM, where they have a crowdsourced um, high precision mapping of their fleet of like 1.5 million vehicles at the moment are on the road. And they map the world with like where are the traffic lights, where are the, the signs, lane markings and so on. And they have that. Um, and it's similar to Tesla in the sense that it's crowdsourced based on the fleet that's out there. Um, but um, yeah, so the supervision system does not have LiDAR. So I, I think it's supposed to work without um, like the three-dimensional three um, mapping that other operators maybe need at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, obviously I think like, my, my understanding of this is limited. I'm not a I'm not a technologist, but my understanding is if you want to use LiDAR, you will need to have a three-dimensional mapping system in place. And I think um, the supervision that's currently deployed in the in the Zika uh, that does not have that. Okay. All right. So um, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, there's been some punditry around all of the various full self-driving or attempts at full self-driving systems that are out there. And most of the of the charts that have been put up, including the one that was put up by you, uh, show that Tesla is the dead last. They're dead last in, I think it said in uh, in technology and in execution or something. I mean, execution, they're dead last. Anyway, uh, what were your thoughts when you, when you put that particular chart up? Um, yeah, so I don't take that very seriously. Um, I think it's more like a marketing tool for them. Um, and I don't know, maybe Tesla is will, will unlikely to be a customer. So they try to put them, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have much detail. I mean, these scales are strategy and execution. So very subjective um, access there. So um, yeah, it, it doesn't mean that much to me, but I put the chart in there to show that at least like these, um, these um, yeah, I don't know what all the research organizations they typically put mobile eye right up there at the top with Waymo and Cruz. And um, yeah, so I just put the chart in there to, to demonstrate that mobile eye probably has a good amount of credibility in the space. All right. So now let's let's talk about what you're a true expert at. So you look at this valuation. They're doing two billion in sales annually. By the way, I got that wrong in my YouTube video the other day. I said it was 500 million. That was per quarter. That's where I missed it. So it's actually two billion a year. They do two billion a year. Tesla will do over 100 billion this year. I did close to 100 billion last year. So the companies, in terms of just weighing both companies, Tesla is 50 times as large as they are, um, and and probably way more than 50 times this year. Um, and then in terms of uh, profit, uh, they're losing. Um, how much do they lose? Um, they almost break even. I think maybe like 100 million um per year the loss like it's it's not much it's not like they're burning a lot of money but they're also not making a lot of money so after 20 years in business they're they're still losing money in the meantime tesla is throwing off something on the order of between 12 and 17 percent um uh, operating operating profits um and so that would say once again that they're substantially massively uh, have a greater value, you would think, uh, on the face of it. So, but in 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 real in real in real point of fact, it's five times only one fifth the value. So let's call it one sixty versus thirty billion. Um, that's pretty crazy, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah. So we probably uh, need to uh, 
to, to have a true apples to apples to, to the extent it's possible to have a true apples to apples uh, comparison we need to kind of isolate um, only the FSD portion of Tesla and then compare it to their um, progress so right now the two billion dollars um, most of that is as I said the the base driver assist and I don't think that will play a role in the future I think in order for this company to have a future they will need to solve FSD that's the, what the stock is priced to, right? Nobody would value them at like 15 times sales with no earnings if they don't expect them to solve autonomy, right? This, this base driver assist is, is irrelevant for the story right now. Um, so then the question is how much money are they actually making with a sophisticated product? Um, the, the current flagship product, as I pointed out, is the supervision. And that makes, um, yeah, approximately, I think, they don't disclose it, but from the comments that they made in their earnings call, I think it, it's possible to infer that they probably make like maybe 250 million per year with this product. And that also includes the hardware, right? So they also have the, the cameras, the radar and so on, all these things. That is like 250 million. And, and then Tesla has, um, I, I wrote that in another research piece that I posted, um, I think if you look at take rates that, for example, Troy Tesla posts on Twitter, and then also the price that we know um, uh, of, of FSD over time, um, I think FS, Tesla's FSD program currently has a revenue run rate of 1 billion. So that's four times more. And also it's, like, it's at least four times more because the hardware is not even included in there, right? Tesla sells the hardware through their like, normal hardware business. So then you could argue that Tesla's FSD program is at least four times bigger than Mobileye. And that would value Tesla's FSD program at 120 billion, right? And that's, right. Um, yeah, that's like $40 a share approximately. And I think that's what I also, I mentioned that in that article. And I remember, I, I think you took a little bit issue with that. Um, we can get into detail uh, why in, in a moment. Um, but I think it, I could probably have clarified it a bit better what the purpose of this article was. It's not necessary that I say the value today of Tesla's FSD program is $40 per share. It's more like if we compare it to mobile eye and we think that both are on the right track, then the market could potentially price them at $40, right? And we could disagree with that still. And um, yeah, you, you pointed out correctly that uh, as I mentioned in my article, um, they currently have 100,000 of these vehicles out there and Tesla has 400,000 vehicles out there. So that again would be a multiple of like four times. But, and that, that was very important in that article too, um, their, um, their CEO said in the earnings call that currently only a few hundred of these vehicles are actually like equipped with a full package. So, um, like the Zika, it's sold with the entire hardware package. And I think Mobileye also gets the entire um, price for supervision for every for every um, unit that Zika produces and sells. But that doesn't mean that all these cars are actually on the road and collecting data and improving the product. Um, um, because I think they sell it for like $5,000. So even if the car has all the capabilities in order to use it, the customer needs to pay another five thousand dollars and and based on the comments that um the ceo made on that earnings call it seems like only a few hundred have done so far and if you then extrapolate from a few hundred to like four hundred thousand then the might that was my intention in that article like the might will become so absurd that it kind of defeats the purpose right if i if i say it's like a thousand times more so like we cannot extrapolate 30 billion by a thousand times so that's why i said okay let's be conservative Let's give them the credit for the entire 100,000 cars. And then again, it's like a four times multiple at the moment. So um, now this is where, you know, I've been playing the market and looking at tech stocks since I was 18 years old, 19 years old. I'm not going to tell you how many years that's been. And you kind of, and I've also done a lot of corporate valuations because I have bought and sold companies and helped other companies to buy and sell, sell companies as part of my consulting business. I'm no, nowhere near the level of sophistication that you are, but I have done this. And and in, and in general, of course, we're looking at some kind of a, a, a valuation based on a future earnings potential and then and then bringing that back down to a current value based on five years or whatever of, of uh, uh, discounted 
uh, uh, discounted um, valuation based on whatever we think the interest rates are going to be over that period. So that, that's kind of a, you know, and maybe it's a multiple of earnings or a multiple of sales, or in, in some cases like lawyers, it's just a, a multiple of total gross sales, like a one year multiple of gross sales. So there's different ways of valuing, but with a tech company that's actually in manufacturing, but that is a startup in a sense, because they're not making any money. I sometimes think that you have to look at this risk risk valuation uh, or what do you want to maybe a a super high potential valuation on the upside versus what are the risks on the downside and do some balancing act because other because there's no way to value it based on its earnings or it would be worth you know maybe maybe 500 million right now or something so does that make any sense am I am I am I looking at it the right way or should I be looking at it differently yeah, it's, you're probably thinking about like like applying probabilities of certain scenarios, right? Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the right way to do. It's it's just very challenging to select these uh, probabilities. I think you have to put a lot of work into what the technology can do compared to um, yeah, competitors, for example. But I think it's the absolutely the right way to do it. Um, I think if I had, to, I haven't done a full valuation on Mobileye. But if I had to, I would probably try to see what is the success probability and, and then multiply that with what would then the, the, um, the outcome be. Um, and then the alternative would be that the company would be worthless, basically, because I think if they, if they cannot achieve um, full self-driving um, or at least a much more sophisticated version than what they have on the road right now, I think the company is probably toast uh, because the base driver assist will not support this valuation at all um, in like say five years from now. So if we take some analogies, um, which I know Elon hates analogies, but if we take a couple of analogies, a year ago or so during the go-go days of the stock market, Rivian and Lucid both had valuations, I think closing in on a hundred billion, even though they had no factories, they had no working <laughs> product um, and they had, uh, uh, you know, only the hope and the dream that maybe someday they would have a, a working product. And right now, Tesla at over 100 billion in sales and all these profits is only worth a, 160 billion. So there seems to be a, a real disconnect. And again, I would, I would, in my way of thinking about it, the disconnect is that Rivian and Lucid and some of these other uh, electric car companies had prospects that would be just massive if they were successful. Um, but the risk was complete loss um, and, and, a, and a fairly high risk based on the history of auto companies. It was a fairly high risk that they wouldn't make it, which has been proving out to be pretty true uh, with these startups in America. Now, the startups in China have been doing pretty well, but the startups in America, not so great. So um, if I'm looking at Tesla's um, FSD as a separate product and trying to evaluate it in this market, which is not the go-go market we had a year ago, I would say, okay, they've got 400,000 units out there at, at probably an average $10,000 each uh, that they charge for them. And they got a bunch more units probably that are out there that are getting 200 a month. Um, they have almost no cost in terms of the, in, in term, uh, other than their massive amount of, uh, of uh, uh, intellectual property that's gone into them. The, the capex is, is probably pretty high um, in terms of development, but there, there's not really going to be any loss on that except within the the general overhead of the company, or the general overall company. Um, so massive upside potential if it hits. Unbelievable upside potential because they already have over 2 million cars on the road, 3 million cars, 4 million, I forget what it is now, 4 million, I think, cars on the road that are all equipped and ready to switch over if necessary. And four factories and a fifth one being built that can produce future millions of robotaxis. So the upside potential seems to me to be beyond, as you said in the beginning, almost beyond thinking about it with almost no risk. So it would seem like Tesla as a company that's that the market would be modeling in something for that massive potential. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And it's, it's, it's very exciting to think about that. And then the dire reality at the moment um, where the share price is or what at least what the share price has done, let's say over the past 18 months, 
um, yeah, it's sometimes um, challenging to focus on the first thing, right? That that you just outlined so um, optimistically. But yeah, I, I share your optimism, and uh, yeah, I think all this, all these articles that I published over the past months on Tesla, I think I wrote a lot, um, way more than in the time before that. It's kind of like a therapy for me to deal with this um, share price performance and like to try to make sense of something that didn't make sense to me. So in the overall market, and I think you and I, I, I might want to do another video with you. So look forward to this, folks. I might want to do another video uh, talking about the general macro right now in the general market and how you see that. But in general, we know we're in risk off right now. And we know that technology companies and especially risky, risky uh, growth companies don't get the same kind of valuations in risk off as they do in risk on. Um, do you see that as being the major reason why Tesla stock is pounded down so badly right now? Um, yeah, probably like the whole risk off. I think that's important. The interest rate increases and so on. That is way more than um, what was anticipated before. And I think probably we got also lulled a bit into all these price increases with these dramatic wait times. And I think we kind of overestimated what the average sales price and the average gross profit per vehicle would be for the near term. Um, I think that's probably the biggest disappointment. Um, and um, yeah, I think that is being priced in right now. And I think I posted that in January when I was actually, I was very um, optimistic at that point in time that um, there could be a bounce back um, because uh, Tesla is pricing in a lot of bad things right now. Um, some of these things will come in the in the near term and midterm. Some of these will come to fruition, but others won't. And my I, my uh, hypothesis was and still is that these price cuts will probably lead to a higher degree of um, uh, yeah, price elasticity than people expect, uh, because you cannot just decrease the price and next day people will storm your store. Um, it takes time for people to make an, an, a purchase decision on a vehicle, and. Um, and, and then these price increase, these price decreases that need to get into the minds of the customers or of the prospective customers. And then over months and, and quarters, that will then lead to an increased, um, increased sales rates. And, and that's my, my hypothesis for the remainder of this year that both the price cuts that Tesla has implemented and also there are some headwinds in the broader macro, macro environment, especially in the automotive market for the past year or so or past two years those will probably become tailwinds soon. And so my, I, my expectation is that we will probably see upside surprises in the volumes um, for the remainder of this year. And my hope is then based on that expectation that stock will then recover um, from them. So are you as crazy as me? Do you have your number over 2 million for this year? Um, well, I tried in the past to to make predictions uh, short term, like even like earnings uh, per share and stuff like that. Terms are like I'm not very good at that. Um, so, uh, but I, I do believe that the 1.8 million number that they are guiding is probably um, a bit lower than um, like an expected value could be. Um, like if you think about the, the first quarter and you annualize that, you take seasonality into account. Um, I think there would need no additional growth and no additional um like uh, cyclical recovery and and they would just sail to a number that would be more than 1.8 million so i think it's extremely conservative and we need also consider that elon is um very uh, bearish on the entire economy right now um so maybe he will be uh, proven like too pessimistic and, and i think that will um yeah, that also probably uh, impacts their guidance there. So I think the 1.8 is probably a number that they would easily clear. Um, yeah, let's see how much. But I think, to be honest, if they hit 1.8 million, maybe the stock will even be higher by the end of the year than today because markets even don't believe um, their guidance. Because I think the, two, the, the, the current Wall Street estimate for the, for the second quarter, I think of like, I don't know, 430,000 vehicles or something like that. I don't think that will get them to 1.8 million. Yeah. So even if they clear the guidance just by a little bit, the, the price could or could react favorably to that. All right. Hey, Renee, this has been great. I definitely want to have you back. 
Um, so uh, if you liked having Renee on the show, please hit the like button. And that way I'll have him back 17 times instead of just the two that I'm already planning to do. So, and then hit the subscribe, um, hit the notify because there's amazing shows coming up this week. And then of course, we'd love to have you on Patreon. So thank you again, Renee, for being on. And for, for those of you out there, it's been great talking to you. Click the link below to get your paperback, Kindle or audiobook now.